This is a J Mix exclusive. Okay. I heard about Russ, Russ's death um, <clears throat> within five or six hours of it happening. It was later in the afternoon. And I found out on the internet. Nobody called me. Nobody told me uh, anything about it. Um, I never heard anything. Michael didn't call me or tell me anything about it. Um, they were all busy, I guess, kind of circling their own wagons or, or getting their own affairs in order. I don't expect them to reach out to me. Uh, but again, like I just talked about... I thought it would have been nice to give you the heads up before I read it in the paper somewhere. And, of course, I did. I read it in, online. And I was stunned. Um, it just kind of the breath got knocked out of me because I just don't... I don't see Russ as the kind of guy who would, you know, just collapse and die. I mean, he just always seemed kind of a blowhard dude, you know, when he's got a guy that was just rough and bulletproof and he just never kind of seemed like that guy that would just drop from a heart attack. Now that said, Russ did have problems with his blood pressure. Russ did have problems with his heart. And I don't know what happened at that sheriff's station that caused that. It could have been him, it could have been external. I, I don't know, I can't speculate, but I do know that Russell having a heart attack was not completely out of the realm of possibility for us. I mean, we all got to go of something. And if you've already got a heart attack or heart problems and blood pressure problems, and you're kind of an intense person like Russ was, um, you know, it can, it can happen. So I, I don't I don't think that, uh, that that's, that's so far out of the narrative that people are just shocked about how that went. Were you still working close with Russ? No, uh, unfortunately, we kind of had a division of labor. Michael and Russ, like I said, they wanted to keep, you know, pursuing the investigation, pursuing the investigation. Honestly, the, I'd been doing it for 10 years. Russell had taken a break for a while and hadn't been working the investigation. So he'd had several years where it really wasn't a priority for him. And Michael was brand new into it when we brought him on board. So neither one of them had spent that, but for me, with Frank and with everything that was going on, I've spent almost 10 years in this. And so when the, we dropped the book, I had promised my family that I'd spend a little more time with my family and that I would not pursue the Tupac thing uh, or the Biggie thing um, with a lot of veracity like I had been. But I'd slow it down a little bit, enjoy my family time a little bit more. Your kids are only kids one time, so you got to, you know, you got to cut your priorities. And uh, so we didn't know we weren't as close as, uh, as we could have been or ha as we had been up until the end of the writing of the book. But, you know, when you see people that make a movie, people, film stars on a film crew, that these people, you know, they're together for a period of time. They make the movie, the movie's out, and then they go their separate ways. And that's kind of how it was. Um, you know, and nobody lived in anybody's pocket even when you were writing the book. But we did work very closely. Now, on to the Reggie Wright question. I got sent a link to the Reggie Wright Bomb First interview. And to say that it was utterly tasteless would probably be the understatement of the millennium. Um, this clown gets on there and he's laughing about Frank Alexander and Russ Poole being dead. And I don't think even people that have disagreements or people that have issues with other people, I, I, I just don't think publicly laughing about it is the right way to go about it. Somehow, Reggie Wright had already contacted, called, set up the phone interview, and executed the phone interview within almost two hours of Russ's death. Now, how that message got to Reggie Wright Jr. is still very much an open matter for speculation because I don't know how they got it. 
I don't know how this clown found out, and I don't know how the people of Bob First found out about it. When somebody goes and has a heart attack at a sheriff's station, it's not like anybody's running around making press releases about it. He went to the coroner, but during that time, somebody must have reached out to somebody who reached out to Reggie Wright. So, you know, how that happened is, is a mystery to me. Now, him getting on board with that website, the Bomb First website, him saying, oh, you know, I'm glad, oh, it's a good day for me. These people are dying. Russell Poole's dead. Frank Alexander's dead. Michael Moore's dead. You know, I ain't, I ain't wishing death on anybody, but, you know, I'm probably R.J. Vaughn's going to be the one to go next. Well, bullshit. Okay. Bottom line was Russ had a heart problem. Frank had a haunted, haunted spirit. And I'm not sure that I fully understand what happened with Frank. But I got news for you, dude. It had nothing to do with karma. It had nothing to do with anybody getting any vengeance for anybody that might have pointed the finger at Reggie Wright Jr. Period. And the fact to say that R.J. Bond's probably going to be the next one, you know. So, sorry, dude. Still waiting. So, I would just basically say um, I thought it was tasteless. I thought it was inappropriate. I didn't like my name being drugged into the conversation about Russ Poole. And when he did that, he kind of opened up the door. And I think that's actually when I made the decision to go ahead and do part three and bring the whole fucking house down. Do you know why Russ was at the LAPD meeting that day? Well, he wasn't at the LAPD. He was at the LA Sheriff's Office. And quite honestly, I was a little bit perturbed when I found that out because I didn't understand it. I understood that Russ had learned some more information and that maybe he was going to try to convey that. But after we got, you know, gang raped by the LAPD in terms of leaking the confession letter and putting it out there and then running us in circles for a year later, pretending that they were doing an investigation on it and turning around and saying that there was nothing they could do. I got a call from the lead investigator, Dolly Swanson, who was the one investigating the case for the LAPD, and she was told specifically that she could not serve search warrants on Darren Dupree's hard drive or anything to do with Darren Dupree, who would have been the only one who had possession of that letter when it left that office that could have given it to Greg Cady and could have given it to Anton Beatty. And, they, and the LAPD forbade her from getting a search warrant on him or anybody else that would have projected that case forward. So I thought Russ would have learned by our beating by the LAPD that going to the police department with your allegations isn't always a great idea, as noble as it sounds. And that was Russ. Russ was very noble. And I thought we were doing the right thing when we went to the LAPD, and they absolutely proved me wrong. And uh, in the meantime, <clears throat> and a lot of people were put at risk. So... Russ was there with new information regarding the One Oak Club shooting of Suge Knight, and he was there to try to get the sheriffs to open up an investigation about that shooting because there was information that an off-duty sheriff's officer was actually involved in the shootings in one way or another, I'm not sure, but uh, that he was involved. This is a J Mix exclusive. What up, we're shut up.